like for me it was it was weird for me like Cruz said like it was not something that I thought was like super cool or I found super entertaining we just went and we saw the stone cold faces of the people who are asking us for asking my mom for her ID and just like it just wasn't like a real welcoming environment but then again it like has to do with where you live and the people in your community like Tomas was saying for him it wasn't like that he went in there and everybody was on the same <laughs> was on the same idea so yeah but moving on to our next question um, we want to talk about the conversations that you have about voting. So what are conversations about voting like with you, your family, and your friends? Is there a sense of excitement or a lack thereof around voting? And I see Kayla, and then we'll do Amir, then Christian. So I think this very obviously depends upon the views of the person you're speaking about voting with. Um, I think the common consensus of all parties involved is that everyone should vote. Uh, hopefully that's the common consensus of all parties involved. However, um, I think depending on the, the candidate that you're supporting uh, kind of determines, you know, how the conversation will go beyond like, oh, you're voting, you're voting. Who are you voting for? But And I think it's because our candidates, which is often the case, but our candidates are two starkly different people um, in many ways, as far as their, their stances, the platforms that they stand on. Um, maybe not in character, but uh, as far as their platforms, they're two completely different people. Uh, and so I think the conversations, generally speaking, begin as positive, like, yeah, we'll vote, everybody should vote. But then beyond that, it becomes more tense um, and argumentative, I would say, depending on who you're speaking to. Um, so, yeah, some of my experiences, like, like especially with my family and stuff, um, they told me, like, you know, sometimes it gives them, like, a little bit of a, an extra, like, like, especially this year of, like, anxiety and stress or whatever, because, like, the days are counting down. It's getting closer and closer and closer. And, like, depending who you're going for, it's, like, that can either make your day, you know, from then on be pretty, you know, joyful, or it can be a totally other different type of, you know, vibe. So I think um, it's very, very important to discuss that uh, with your family and around your family, just to get your ideas off and really uh, be able to talk to somebody about this, this type of thing. Because, like, the political climate right now is extremely, extremely intense, and we have to really let off steam per se and trying to get our ideas out there and really uh just communication is key in that in that time so well i can tell you um in my family it's 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 everybody is like amped up to vote um but with friends and when i have conversations just out in the general public i get a lot of mixed um responses to that there are a lot of people who um are not as excited about voting. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with not really understanding um, the United States and how voting operates here. And I know we'll probably get to some of that later with some of the other questions. And it also gets to what um, Kayla was saying, but there are a lot of people who feel um, um, like it's a waste of time because their voice isn't really mattering or, or their voice isn't counting. And so what I normally try to do is just really just kind of have a one-on-one -on -one intervention and kind of talk to them about that. But again, it's kind of mixed with friends, but with family, it's really a strong, you know, a lot of excitement. Yeah, if um, I could jump in. I feel like that's another thing that is really weird about voting and it, and it's more you see it more this year than any other year where when it comes to family people seem to be on the same page but then when you talk about your friends and your family friends i've seen this a lot with my mom it kind of gets iffy about the whole election it's kind of weird how like relationships like friendships are ending over the election which Maybe in this case, it makes sense, but we've seen it in past elections. We've seen it in the last election, the election before that, where like friendships, like year, year long friends, like 10 year long friendships ending over one election. And I find that really strange and weird. 
but I'm gonna pass it on to Christian. And I got a lot of thing, things to say with uh, Dr. Key and Everett there. Um, just to see fresh chips getting completely destroyed because of the elections and stuff. And uh, it's worrying to know that people are still kind of doing that. I understand why. It's a lot of, it's just, most of the time it's hard to talk about voting, for sure. But um, I just want to use like last year's election as an example where there were, um, you know, a lot of people that were uninformed voting for their first time voting for someone that has you know no statistical value at all as we could say and um a lot of people in that were just saying you know clinton's a woman so let's just vote for the other one because why would we want it's just depressing to see that and that's why i mean i was younger at the time but i still saw how bad that was and for this year it's well no trump's the best right he he did so great he memes it's funny to vote him back in it's just it's extremely hard because there's so many different dynamic di dynamic uh, views on it. And I'm still with my family, of course, saying it's stand up to vote and vote for the right people, which, you know, <laughs> it's what we're doing for sure. But it's crazy to see all this stuff still going on. I'm sure it's going to keep going on. But as it is now, I mean, just do the right thing. Kind of to chime in real quick. Um, me personally, I can say me and my family kind of felt a myriad of different um, feelings towards this election from fearful, kind of like nervous, kind of even a little bit of hopeless in a sense, because I've been seeing a lot of large Trump pent signs everywhere. Our governor is uh, or no BS governor and due to our lovely governor and all these terrible signs. I've seen them and the Biden signs I see, the few I see. Um, they're like index cards and the Trump ones are like billboards, you know, and it's just that it scares us. So my family were kind of, like I said, fearful, a little hopeless, but at the same time, we're eager and we're ready to put the work in to try and have our voices heard as well as others. My dad, he's like, he's taking the whole day off the days, maybe a couple days before he's trying to drive people up there. How can I volunteer? How can I do all of this? And if you guys check out my, my parody I did about voting, um, social media world, I can give you some information on there about how to um, volunteer and whatever have you for the um, election. But like I said, with the hopelessness part, I feel like that's kind of another factor that really drives a lot of people away. They're like, oh, well, this seems like they're, this person's getting a lot more attention than the candidate I want, so I'm just not going to vote. It has nothing to do with me and this and that. And I just want to let you know that's the exact mentality that's going to get somebody you don't want back in office. You got you to gotta be eager. You got to be here. You got to spread that energy with everybody else because then everyone's going to be like, oh, we're going to win or tell, you know, and they're all going to be like that in the snowball effect. Everybody's going to, you know, do action. And um, I was also going to say, too, that even though we're really pointing out in the past, um, in this conversation, in the last one, yes, local elections are important, but still the, the, um, the general election, the presidential election, I mean, the president has the power to send um, special agents and certain agent you know groups and departments to your community and they can go above your local government they just you know they just shoo them away like a like a gnat a house fly that's what they do to them and they come over and do whatever they have to do and you know the president the president is the one who decides what wars we go you know and things like that how foreign policy and i'll just say for the next one in latin america or for the latino one but you know just if you're out there, if you're Christian, especially, or a believer of God, like myself, you just educate yourself, you know, because just, if you know, they teach us in the Bible, the Beatitudes, Ten Commandments, to care for your neighbor. And if you looked at some of the policies throughout history that our government has enacted upon in other nations, whether it be the Middle East or Latin America, sometimes America is the reason why for their problems, you know, like it's, for example, with the narcos and all that other bad stuff in Latin America, it's not just them it's fuel to the fire you know so i just wanted to point that out there too like for all those people out there that are really about being ethical and you know um you know kind of other people you know kind of think twice you know and don't feel hopeless if you're out there feeling hopeless cut that out right now and light some sage do whatever you want i don't know just have hope hope 2020 yeah thank you so much those are uh, go ahead. Point. Um, for me, it's in my in my household. It's kind of like an expectation that we go and vote. Um, 
And so we're not, we don't necessarily get excited in conversations and things like that. But with my friends, I'm kind of the opposite of Dr. Key. Um, some of my friends are really excited to vote. And then I have some people who kind of fall into that middle ground where they're like, eh, I don't really like voting because I don't think that my voice actually matters. And so then we get into, you know, discussions and debates and things like that. And so I, I think um, our generation does have a passion for it, at least at this moment. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's a lot that's gone through the, this, um, this ballot. And so I, I kind of think it's, interesting if you don't feel compelled to be either side or something like that. Because um, really, at the end of the day, we're choosing who represents us. And so you're picking the candidate that you feel represents you the best. And um, yeah, sometimes that leads to heated discussions. And personally, I try to um, still be friends with and listen to other perspectives different than mine. But I also understand that that's not easy. And that's not something that everybody can do. So I also don't blame anyone who feels like you know, this this friendship we had, it's got to go because the things you stand for, I don't stand for. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, you all have some really good points. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is uh, Tomas kind of pointed out his parody, and I just want to kind of shout that out. If you go to fire810 at youtube.com, you can uh, watch his uh, parody. That's F P H Y A. 810.com or or whatever it is at the YouTube channel. Just look that up on YouTube. You can watch his parody. It's really good. He has some really good information there. Go check that out. But um, we're going to move on to the next question. Thank you all. Thanks, Everett. All right. Do you think the voting process in this country is flawed and should it be restructured? All right. Kayla? Sorry, Hampers. I feel like everyone unanimously kind of like nodded their head and like no one said anything. So I think the, the fact of it's being flawed is kind of a well-known fact. Uh, much of America doesn't agree with the continual existence of the Electoral College. Much of America takes issue with the fact that our actual popular vote doesn't choose the, the president, which is, uh, I mean, fundamentally, fundamentally is democracy, is your actual vote choosing who actually entered office, not like this in-between system that America created because at its inception, our forefathers didn't actually want democracy. And I think so we're, we're reaching kind of a, a pivotal point uh, in America and I think in democracies in general where we're beginning to recognize the flaws uh, that were kind of written into our constitution, the flaws that were written into the structure and the functioning of American society. And one of those being the process of us voting for a president. The fact that our voting system isn't, a, in, isn't exactly a direct connection to the final decision that, that's made. And uh, so hopefully fairly soon, uh, there's there's some actual work done surrounding that. However, considering the fact that the politicians and the people in power benefit from the fact that we don't technically have a direct line to them, um, it I I don't know how soon soon would be, but uh, hopefully, uh, considering the the polls that have been taken and the number of U.S. citizens that don't agree with uh, our current voting system that hopefully we can set aside partisan issues for the sake of assuring that our democracy is actually democratic. <laughs> All right, Amir? Um, so I have the same sentiment that, uh, that I'm, uh, Caitlin just said. Uh, so for me, I think uh, our voting process has way too many like holes and everything like that, the way that voter suppression can come in. Um, for example, just give me one quick example. There was like uh, in Detroit, there was these hotlines that people would, uh, th that homes would get calls from. And they would basically be almost like threats almost and be like, oh, if this certain party is going to do this, blah, 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 so on and so forth. I think it's just way too many avenues how people can just really twist it and really come up with their own type of methods and way to try to get in and basically take control of the vote and really not give the American people the real type of, um, let's say, exposure or the type of voting count that they, they would expect to. So 
So I think that's a really big thing. You got Cruz and then you had Tomas hand. Um, I guess I'll go first. Um, I think it's, there's a lot of issues like how Amir was sort of pointing to. Um, the fact that we believe that it's a right to be taken away in the first place, I kind of have an issue with. Um, as a citizen, I feel like that should just be something that you should be able to do. You should have a say in your country. I mean, that's the whole point of democracy to me. And um, I think it's strange that we set so many things in place to disrupt that, uh, whether it's voter suppression or doing things like voter fraud, um, setting up systems to make it so that it's difficult to vote. Um, there are, I mean, you could pay your taxes online. And you, why isn't that a thing that you can vote everywhere? online. Um, it's things like that that, you, that make you question, like, where do we have our priorities? Um, and then you stack that on top of, you know, we got issues with how we can take a strip away the right from, let's say, felons and th people like that. Um, there's so many issues there. It's, it's past the Electoral College. I think it's sort of what Kayla was saying. It wasn't really set up to be correct. Um, the, the forefathers, they weren't perfect. And we should stop acting like they were. And just like how we have corruption in our government today, there was corruption back then. And so there, there definitely needs to be change. I would like to believe that we could come to some sort of conclusion that's positive on both sides, where we just suggest, yo, we need to change this. And so let's do it. Um, but I don't know if people are stubborn. And so that's kind of why we need to be voting. These people do not belong in offices. They're, they obviously have personal interests. Um, stepping into the lines of the Electoral College, I know we're going to do that the next question, so I'm going to wait on that. Um, but I definitely have something to say on that as well. I kind of feel um, kind of, yeah, the sentiments of everybody, what they've said, you know, that I feel voter suppression is always going to be here. I feel that kind of sometimes based on who is the head of state at the time will kind of influence how maybe severe it is. I mean, there's certain, um, you know, certain um, factors that have still remained throughout time. Like, for example, the purging and the caging and the, you know, um, lack of polling stations in black and brown areas and things like that. Those are always going to remain around. The disenfranchisement is probably going to remain around because people know about our, um, our power that we have. People know the inmates who are predominantly black in the system, they have a voice. They know the black people have the voice, which is why they're trying to suppress them in their communities, as well as my people and everybody else who is vulnerable, it's disabled people, you know, elders and whatnot. But I feel that based off the certain candidate that is in office, that there are um, sometimes more, the voter suppression is more highlighted and underlined because, um, you know, you have people that are spreading this kind of rhetoric and hate-filled energy and whatnot. But real quick, I just wanted to point out real quick, I seen we had the lovely Mrs. Gutierrez in the chat. She kind of mentioned about, I want to point it out real quick. So she said that somebody that she knew voted for Trump last week because they believed and they were um, part of a, a <clears throat> Christian church. You know, I'm not trying to put any specifics out there because I want to protect their privacy. But basically, um, they voted for Trump because they believed that God sent them sent Trump to kind of be the um, person that kind of ends. Let me read the question partially because I don't want to mess up what they said about how God is, or God sent Trump to kind of end the times or something like that. And the God is just trying to, you know, prove his power. Me, how I'm going to respond to that as a devout Catholic Christian, we don't know God's plan. We don't know the day, hour, minute, millisecond, trip a second, whatever have you, we don't know when God is going to end the world, what his plan is for us as individuals, or for us as a collective group. So I would just have to say to everybody that's kind of like, you know, because I've heard that too, that, you know, Trump is being sent by God to end it all for us. But here's my thing, you know, in a way that's a little bit, um, you know, shade to the people that believe that, but in a way that's kind of disrespectful to God, because we're trying to assume, make a, out of you and me, about, you know, kind of his plans and what he has in store for us. So I don't, I don't think that you, you shouldn't fall under that. And would you really think God is going to make us suffer? He, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't want his people to suffer. I mean, we're already suffering enough, but I don't think God would 
intentionally put someone like that. The only person that is going to end the world is God. He said that in the book of Revelations. You know, he's going to have the seven churches of eight. You know, I'm, I don't want to confuse anybody or whatnot, but basically, long story short, God is the only person that knows the time, our date, when the world is going to end, and we can't, we can't assume and plan that. So I would just have to say to all my religious folks, just remember what you were taught in um, catechism. Remember what you were taught in the sermon, lecture, preaching, service, whatever. So that's just what I have to say. And I think a couple other people wanted to respond to that question because um, her end of her statement was, do you guys have any advice on how to engage people that think that way? And I know Kayla wanted to respond. Go ahead. So I would say uh, to first lead with love um, because I don't, I don't think that anyone is, is voting in either direction in order to uh, specifically be hateful, I think, I would hope. And um, I, I think you have to approach these people who believe that they're doing what's best for themselves, especially when it's a religious belief. You don't want to attack someone's uh, religious belief because oftentimes that's the foundation of who they are and how they function. Uh, I would ask that you question these people like, okay, well, what, what, what does your God stand for? What principles does, does your God support? Uh, what ways of living does your God support? What ways of treating people does your God support? Does Trump align with any of those things? Uh, and if the answer is yes for them, um, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure at, at that point, maybe you want to question their theology, but uh, I, I think to, to truly vote, to vote for the end times, uh, I, I think as Tomas says, is to put the, the job of Christ in, in your hands. And I, I don't believe that, that that's uh, the, the intention of these people uh, who who maybe would vote that way. But so that I say that to say, engage with them with their own texts, engage with them with an understanding of, um, of their beliefs, and then truly educate them upon Trump's platform and what he stands for. And I, I think, like I said, if you, if you leave with love and you're truly empathetic and enter it not with temper, uh, but with with a calm, even keeled uh, mind, I think you're more likely to reach them uh, where they are. Anyone else want to speak to that before we pivot back to the other question? Yeah, I wanted to just uh, put a little bit in on that one. So um, I look at it um, similar to Tomas and Kayla, but I kind of have a different spin on it. So her, the end of her question is, do you guys have advice on how to engage, engage people that think this way? And for me, I guess it was because I was raised a different way. But when I was like, as growing up, when you see somebody who's stuck on an idea who think a certain way, you don't always shoot to change somebody's mindset. You kind of love them from a distance, you know, like you don't always have to be the saving grace. You don't always have to be the one that comes in and changes the world for the better, but you can change it on your part. So it's not always up to you to change somebody else. And I guess that's how I look at it because you can't, most of the time, 99.9% .9 and a half of the time, like Tomas said, you're not going to be able to change somebody how they think religiously because religious, like that's embedded into the person. So you're not going to be able to change somebody religious belief, but what you can do is love them from a distance. Although they are voting and you don't think that it, um affects you in a great way you can't you're not you don't hate them because they do what they do like you can just love them from a distance it's not always up, it's not always up to you to change somebody so so i want to um kind of add to that oftentimes i tell people when you're dealing with people who may think differently and or have different value systems or sets you can't and when we talk about religion specifically you can't necessarily speak to change the religion, but you can speak to the evolution of the person, not always the religion. There are some people that have been in religion for years and then all of a sudden they have this epiphany and their mind evolves and they, they grow in whatever their belief is. So just be intentional about speaking to the evolution and know that that evolution doesn't mean it's gonna manifest right then at the end of that conversation. Sometimes you may just drop a seed and it may not sprout or manifest to a year or two down the line or a couple of months or sometime 10 years down the line. 
but it does what, what, what it was designed to do. But I will say this, this is a larger conversation because we all have to understand, and let's be really critical about this. Religion has also been used as a tool of oppression and suppression. People kill people in the name of religion. The slaves were forced to, and religion and scripture was used, you know, slaves obey your masters. This is, the, this is right in the sight of the Lord. That's a really a scripture. So you also have to understand it's not about the religion, but it's the manipulation of the religion and how people have been manipulated by leaderships in religion to do that. I think that every major religion has something to contribute to our value system, to our character. I believe everyone has some right in it and everybody has some wrong in it. And so um, I think that when we, and, and, and being a person who is a part of the Pentecostal church myself, and it's like, okay, uh, some of the biggest supporters of, 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 of Trump currently are in, 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 that reforma in those types of reformations. And it's like, it seems as if racism is not a deal breaker for a lot of these reformations, which makes me now look side-eyed at the value systems that many of these have. But I, I'm glad that we're able to have these types of conversations because it allows us to look deeper. Let's look at the history of religion. And there is a difference between religion and spirituality. Right, religion is a system that that, that tries to that, that that I say religion is man's attempt to understand a higher power or God, and spirituality is a relationship that God gives you to understand who He or she, whatever your belief is, is. Right, and so I think we get caught up in the systems that religion creates, and again, those systems force those slaves to pick that cotton because they had to do whatever their masters told them. So I just wanted to say that th there are those things that we just need to have in context when we think of, and, and a lot of people, I, I'm one of my mentors, Mr. Deloney used to say, just cause you go to church, that don't mean you are supposed to stop thinking and using your gray cells just cause the preacher get up and say, do A, B, and C. And if you know A, B, and C is gonna make you sick, you don't, I mean, it doesn't mean that now you have no brain and, 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 and you just, you become this almost zombie-like creature that just do that does what it's told it's not like that and i don't think god ever designed for any of us to be walking around like zombies you know just coming off the manufacturer line doing everything else that everybody else is doing so anyway i thank you jessica for that conversation that was a a wonderful pivotal pivotal um point for us did anyone else want to respond to that before we go back to our next question we have time I to take an offering now you didn't preach we should sing i just feel like i mean well okay send all your offers to p.o box four four no i'm just playing i'm just playing i'm just playing i'm not a televangelist all right go ahead um our back to our host <laughs> okay thank you everybody uh thank you again jessica for that question uh, moving on we're going to kind of pivot back uh to talking about the electoral college um, do you feel the community in general is adequately educated on the electoral, electoral college? And let me see. I see Christian. No. It's just no. So, I mean, and the electoral college in its own entirety is just a system, for sure, a system that shouldn't really be going on since you know the very beginning of voting and stuff like that it basically renders voting of the popular vote to like this electoral you know candidate may win right he may be winning because that's what you guys wanted us to do as a popular vote and because of you know clinton v um uh, trump last year that made it even worse it just shows that they just like hey, you know what no popular opinion doesn't really matter to us we'll just choose who we want anyway but Technically, what they're supposed to be doing is choosing for the state and then, you know, choosing, you know, in the wide band of their state, even though most of them just didn't listen to the state. Uh, clearly, the popular vote was what the popular vote was, and that was for Clinton. And uh, here we are with Trump, and that's still, <laughs> still a joke and how he won. So, I mean, education in it, it's a lot of people know what they do. They just think it's, you know whatever right like they can't do anything about it but you can 
And that's if you vote. <laughs> More votes will make it a bigger gap and stuff like that. So if you, you know, spend your time to vote, then the whole, oh, your opinion doesn't matter. I'm just going to choose who I want because the state said so won't really be an issue. I'm going to go next. Um, so, no, that, like, like Christian said, the answer is no. Um, they also do that on purpose. Um, when, when you take a government class in U.S. history, they don't really talk about the Electoral College much, much, and they do that on purpose. And the reality is when it was originally created, it was supposed to be like a check and balance. Um, it was supposed to be there just in case, you know, things went wrong or awry. But really what it kind of was, was uh, I don't think the people really know what they want. So I'm going to vote who I think it's supposed to be. Um, and that's unfortunate. It, it really is. I, I think that there should be some sort of checks and balance system. But the electoral college definitely isn't it. Like it's not doing its intended job. Um, the fact that we need to vote for representatives to vote for representatives is strange. Um, and yeah, it, it kind of takes somewhat of the purpose out of it, like the whole concept of democracy. And I, I don't get why we've continued to act like, once again, this is such a important integral part of our system when um, it, it's, the, its main use is just meant to be like, all right, my vote, my state voted a certain way, so I'm gonna vote the same exact way. Why do we really need that person? And it's because that person's there to sometimes ignore that, and that's that's silly. Um, and I have a lot of issues with that. And I think it should be talked about more. The fact that it's not coming out is is a large issue. Like it's it's shown to be really important. I mean, because it helps you know our current president win his election. But people don't want to really talk about it because they like that it's there. It, it's kind of one of those tools of oppression that we were talking about earlier. But I, honestly, I think we should, it should be spoken about more, simply put. I saw Kayla's hand up. Um, so I would agree with uh, the two other answers, which is to say that no, I don't believe that the general public has a sufficient understanding of the Electoral College and the way that it functions within our election, uh, our presidential election specifically. Uh, but I also, what I also find interesting is the narratives that have been created recently by our current president who was able to swindle his way, so to speak, into office about how important a fair election is uh, right now in 2020. Uh, he has all of a sudden become very dedicated to the democratic process the way that he imagines it and uh, has is now the, the biggest advocate for everybody voting and the democratic process occurring uh, specifically the way that it was intended to. Uh, and so I just want us to all be very aware and conscious of the, the narratives that are fed to us, even, even by our president, because as we've said, let's be clear, the popular vote, which is the vote of the land, which is, if we were living in a democracy, he wouldn't be in office. And so for him to all of a sudden value the democratic process so passionately is, is something that is self-serving. And, um, and is, is done specifically to make the process of the vote less trustworthy to citizens whom he is the only source of knowledge from. Uh, and so uh, I just want us to be clear that also uh, simultaneously while he is questioning the voting process, uh, he, there, there are also people in these third world countries uh, that we have labeled developing who have leaders who are also questioning their voting processes. And uh, so I just want us to be also conscious of the fact that simultaneously while our president is questioning our voting process and um, making us feel as if he is the only trustworthy source of knowledge and uh, also simultaneously contradicting the uh, professionals on many of the subjects which he's speaking on, there are people in third world countries that uh, are operating under systems of um, communism, um, 
aut- autocracy. Uh, there are, yeah, I'm, I, I just want us to, to acknowledge the fact, like, it's, it's not coincidental that he would, dictatorships, uh, there, 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 are, there are several other government systems that are operating similarly uh, to the way that our current leader is operating. And so I, I, I think this all just feeds into our understanding of democracy and whether or not America can truly be considered one. I saw Everett's hand up. Okay, like like everyone else said, I I uh, I I agree with everyone else. It's definitely not right how things are set up. You know how people are uneducated about something that's so pivotal in our society. How somebody can you know, say, oh, go vote, but then not know about voting, not know what to do when they get there. Or we have these uh, electoral college votes and people aren't don't know what they mean. And it, it's just not fair to everybody else because then we have situations like we're in now where we have a president that most of the country does not agree with in office making decisions that most people don't agree with, but a select few, aka the uh, sorry but a select few do agree with so it's hard to kind of see change when every time we want to incite change we get we have this flawed system that we're using to kind of get somebody else in here when that's not what the electoral college wants to see so i want to say something to that um when we were talking about racism as a public health issue and some other things people oftentimes and i heard what you just said everett and a lot of people use that term calling the system flawed. The system really isn't flawed. It's not broken. It's doing what it was designed to do. And that was for some to be, some to benefit at the expense of others. So it's, it's, so it's not that it's flawed. It's, it's a system that perpetuates inequities and disparities, right? And injustices. And so the thing is not to look and fix the system. The thing is to evaluate the system and deconstruct this dysfunctional system and then to reconstruct a system that has equity, fairness, justice, and that values all people. And so I think that that's part of it. But to your question, and I was just a sidebar, but to your question um, that, that, that was asked, I think that the electoral college process is very flawed. It is very um, corrupt because people can, people are corrupt and people get create these systems to perpetuate corruption. And so for example, we, you guys talked about it in the last um, talk show and the census is directly tied to how many electoral college votes a state gets, right? How many people are in the census determines how many people in a district or in an area that electoral college gets, but then Tomas showed us last week about gerrymandering and how they can change the lines and manipulate the borders within those districts to, you know, to, to either steal the majority or whatever. And so anytime you have systems that do this, and the thing that you have to understand about systems dynamics or systems engineering is that systems replicate, each, replicate themselves. And so when you have systems, orig- the original system was the United States Constitution. That was, and in that original government, that it declared that African people were three-fifths of a human being, right? From, those, from that foundational law that created all of the systems that we have from, from that, all other laws, all other policies and procedures are always weighed against the Constitution. Now those words were amended right later on they amended but did we go back and amend the systems and the policies that were created to create those inequities right so this is a lecture i give i don't want to go into it on here but i just want to drop some of that knowledge on y'all and see if you like it or not i'm going back on mute i mean i I really appreciate that because i kind of um speaks to the point of a racism not existing in America. How can racism not exist in America when the systems that we have are based off racism? So I feel like that's a really uh, good point that Dr. Key put in there. I saw Kayla's hand, so I'm passing on to you. 
I just want to say really quickly, and this is kind of a sidebar to a sidebar that was given, uh, but I, I want us to also be conscious because this is one of our last uh, talk shows before the final election, uh, that when you are voting, you're at this point not only voting for a president, but you're voting possibly for a Supreme Court justice nominee. And the Supreme Court justice nominee is one who has who actively fights to protect the Constitution as it was originally written. And the issue with that being that, as we've all acknowledged, the Constitution as it was originally written completely excluded entire uh, uh, groups and communities of our nation from rights, from these um, inal in unalienable rights. I, I hope I said that right excluded entire groups of people from those rights uh so so just like quick sidebar like at this point it's become even stronger than the the presidency which is a four-term thing like we know that even if trump is voted back into office for another four years that's four years however his nominee that's a lifetime that's a lifetime sentence or a term that that she has and so uh i just want us to also be clear about not only his impact but the greater impact of his supreme court nominee real quick i was going to kind of point out too along with kind of what dr key was saying about how number one with the just briefly how the gerrymandering was used to um kind of like <clears throat> you know suppress the um regions but also kind of to the to my bad i'm about what he was saying about the um the corruption like you know just because someone works in the government doesn't necessarily they're working for you like you have people in the electoral college who vote differently than what the represented area votes for and also i wanted to kind of make this clear out for you too but a lot of us people especially minorities just because somebody looks like us does not necessarily mean we have to vote for them or they're in the favor of us because there's certain people like John James, you know, as have as much melanin more than me or like all of us, we can connect, right? Like he would probably be pulled over by the police just like us as well and people like him. And then, you know, then their, the, their inner, um, their, you know, kind of like their mentality is of the people who's pulling us over, you know? So I just kind of wanted to point that out there too, that you can't always be biased as well you can't, you know, kind of fall into the trap because there's plenty of Latinos. There's that, um, what's his name? He's, I don't want to say nothing, you know, no names, nothing, but you know, this, he, I forgot his name, but he's some, he's in, he's been on CNN. He's like a Trump advisor and he, he just rides Trump just like he, you know, and just like, I just, that's just my point. Just because somebody looks like you does not always mean that they're for you and don't be biased. And we kind of sometimes have to watch out for like the celebrities, because celebrities have a large impact. And us as youth need to collaborate and have a, you know, a voice reach the altitude like they do. Because sometimes many celebrities are influencing people to vote otherwise, you know, vote against us in reality. So just peep game. That's all I have to say, you know, kind of be alert. But and, and so it goes to the saying, Tomas, you can be my color and not my kind, and you can be my kind and not my color. And so you just have to understand um, the values and all of that. So let's transition to the next question. I know we, we're, we're time is, is, is creeping right, upon uh, us because the conversation is wonderful. Go ahead. As much as like the uh, chime in on that, um, mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's like, just because you're famous doesn't always mean you're smart and like, but anywho, we're gonna get onto the next question. What effect do you think social media has on this year's election? This one's this one's doozy. I see a mirror. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yep. So like, it it's come down to like all these different platforms have different viewpoints. Like, if you notice, like they they put up Facebook. Facebook has a bunch of just right wing stuff, and then Twitter might be more left leaning. So basically, it's like all partisan. Like this this mixing up and it's not fair to people who just want to follow and just be like neutral and be like oh i'm not gonna vote for this party i'm not gonna vote for this party whatever but i need clear concise information and not just one opinion from each side so that's my thing about it cruz um i'm gonna respond with my answer being twofold the first one is it's kind of hard to ignore social media when our current administration uses it so frequently. 
Um, he be on Twitter a lot. The second part is um, our society is so vocal now. Um, everybody has an opinion, and you're entitled to it. But what was mentioned earlier in the show is that people kind of kept it more of a secret about who they were voting for. And lately, it hasn't really been much of a thing. Um, a lot of the people who suggest that they're going to vote, they a lot of them tend to make their votes obvious. And from that, you know, arguments, discussions come about. Sometimes, unfortunately, hatred, and that happens on both sides. Um, but it's just awful to see so much division in our country. Like, I, we, we're supposed to disagree. That's normal. Um, each person, is, they, they have their own views. And the whole point of voting is to see the collective view, right? But the way that people are currently acting in our society and at least American society on social media, it's very unfortunate, sometimes um, extremely negative. And hopefully our next administration does their best to unite people. Great. Because we need it. Okay, Everett had his hand up, Christian, and then Kayla. Um, so, yeah, I really agree with Cruz because I, I have an experience where, like, for me, social media is sort of a war zone right now. Like, some days you get on there and it's calm and people are laughing and joking. And some days you get in there, it's so divided between just the two parties. And then the craziest part to me is that it's not even people that can vote. The biggest divide is between people my age, 15, 16, who are saying things that their parents say or saying things they see on social media that they think are right and posting it and retweeting and reposting. And it's just such a big divide because people are hating on each other for the smallest thing sometimes rightfully so and maybe i'm a little wrong for saying that <laughs> but sometimes it's right right but a lot of the times it's wrong that we're like choosing to be against each other just because of politics like politics was never supposed to be something that people fight over yeah there's disagreements here and there but you're not supposed to be having full-on battles <laughs> on social media over politics like that's not how it should be so I gotta jump on with uh, Cruz and Everett there. The, um, the, it's been mainly negative on social media. People find things that, you know, just to start up fires and stuff like that. Also, there have been people that wanted to, you know, incite fear and violence in it on Modi on social media with, well, sometimes both groups, both left and right, can go say, you know, oh, I'm gonna go fight or something, you know, tough guy or whatever, if I'm against my royal level or something like that. So it's been, you know, a lot of negativity. There's obviously been a lot of positivity in that as well. And it's always good to find that. But negativity has been, again, just like Eric said, it's been flipping and fly. It's just been going back and forth constantly. So it's a, it's a war zone. Um, so I personally, and I don't know if this differs uh, from what my, what the other panelists have said, but uh, I believe that so social media in many ways functions the same way that society does. Um, I, although I do uh, recognize the fact that people are emboldened by the lack of physical um, presence, uh, I, I still think social media functions in the same way that we do within a society, which is to say that uh, if there wasn't social media, we'd just argue. I, I, I don't think, now the difference being if there wasn't social media, you wouldn't be able to meet someone and then go to social media and check out their profile and know a lot of what they stand for. Uh, however, I, I don't believe that, uh, I don't, one, I don't believe that politics were, were ever something that people didn't argue about. I mean, the fact of the matter is we've had war, war is a result of politics. Um, I, I think when when America was created, um, it, it was because of politics. It's because we decided, like, I don't really like it here. I don't really like the way y'all move. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to steal somebody else's land, and I'm going to move differently over here. So uh, that that is to say that I, I don't think at any point uh, politics has functioned without some sort of heated debate, which we uh, call argument. 
Uh, social media, though, I do believe definitely will impact this election in the same way that it impacted the previous election uh, through memes and the sharing of information. Uh, the previous informa uh, election about uh, how often th certain things would show up on people's timelines, certain memes would show up on people's timelines, and how that informed their vote. Because the, the fact of the matter is, in the age of technology, much of our information is coming from social media. And so uh, there are studies that, that counted the, the number of times that, for, exa for example, Russian ads would show up, or uh, ads and memes about Hillary Clinton's emails, or ads and memes about um, with, with Trump's face on the American flag. Like these things do actively form people's, uh, wh whether they recognize it or not, the way that people make decisions when it comes to our elections and also the way that people decide fact. Uh, if, they, if someone finds Trump more relatable or uh, whatever the case may be, because he's on Twitter constantly, like he, he's for us, he's the president for us because he can tweet with bad grammar. Uh, I, 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 that actively will inform the way that they perceive Trump. And, and that's the fact of the matter. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's for some people, the, the fact that our uh, current administration, a, aka Trump, spends so much time on social media, um, that, that, that fact is like cool for them because it's like, wow, he can't spell, I can't spell either, you know? So these things, these things, I don't want to <laughs> be rude, but these things connect people. And I think social media does that. Um, and so anyway, I digress. Okay, we have Kiera. Um, so I just wanted to jump in and say, so I just let y'all take y'all time because I really appreciate y'all dialogue. And it's really not a need for me to jump in nearly as much because y'all y'all got it covered. Um, now, Jasmine is here with us in spirit and she texted me a couple comments that she want me to incorporate um, as well. But the first thing that I'll start with is when Dr. Key, you ended and um, you're talking about the contrast between um, people who are us, but not really us. And one thing I think you, even, I think you even said it on an earlier talk show um, that I like to say is all skin folk ain't kin folk. <laughs> and you know, that is more than just political views. Um, a big deal is the economic differences between some of our skin folk that do not make that makes them not kin folk um and i remember one of dave Chappelle's stand-ups when he was i can't remember where dave Chappelle lives but he was talking about he was standing in line and wherever he lives is rural and um it's a bunch of white people um who are lower income and they're standing in line talking about everything trump is going to do for them and he's like Trump is about to do stuff for me, <laughs> you know, not you. Like, I'm a millionaire. Trump is not doing anything for you. Um, and then when we talk about social media, Trump is, is, is a very big part of that. But there's Kanye West. And as a Black person, I want us all to succeed. This is a public health um, um, group. And... I pray for his mental health and all of that, but all skin folk ain't kin folk. And I don't know what his motive is, but I do know that some of the people who are blindly following him are hindering everyone's ability to be educated about the political decisions that we need to make. And his public push for office, as well as the big fight between Trump and Biden, is this whole gaslighting that we're eating up that's pushing us away from the real issues which kayla mentioned um the biggest one is the supreme court uh justice pick and i think uh tomaster cruz one of you were talking about the local election and, and local uh authorities that are going to be uh put in place because that's what's most important and i know i've said that before to me and uh christian i, ooh, I think it was christian no, actually, it was cold. I'm sorry. Um, you were you were talking about how people are losing friends over the election, and you hate to see it happening. I don't. It's fine. It's perfectly fine because, like we we discussed earlier, um, politics were not designed where we should be fighting the way we are, but we are, and that's because if you're allowed to say certain things, and people are okay with that 
then that's a problem for me. Um, Tomas was talking about how some of his family members were scared to, you, if your people are scared to talk about a, a candidate because they might be picked up and hauled off somewhere, or my people are scared to go vote because we might be lynched, dragged, tarred and feather and whatever else, then it's more than just about politics. And saying that you're disengaged, people like to say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pick, or I'm in Maryland now, and our governor said, oh, well, you know, I'm going to write in, I'm going to write in Reagan, because I don't know what's going on right now. That's privilege. You have the privilege to say that you're not going to be engaged, because the stuff that these people are talking about aren't affecting you. So I'm not sensitive. This is not about, you know, me losing a friend because you're a Democrat. This is... I'm taking you out of my circle because either you're a racist, a misogynist, and a terrible person, or you're just dumb and you're saying stuff out of your mouth that you're not looking up. And I don't associate with that. So I, I'm perfectly fine with, <laughs> with losing friends, associates, or coworkers because of that, because it is a bigger issue. Um, and Jasmine, Jasmine earlier wanted to chime in and talk about how um, when she went to go vote for Obama in 2012, she thought she was going to vote for Obama and she did not realize all the other stuff that was on the ballot. And political engagement for minority people is so low. And then the ones who do try to make an effort, the system is designed in a way where we won't be able to succeed because it shouldn't be this hard to get resources. You know, we should know what's on the ballot. We should know what we're going to vote for. And the law should not be written in a way where we don't know <laughs> you know, what we're voting on when we go in there. It should be plain. Um, and so that I, um, the other thing Jasmine wanted me to mention was she wanted me to give a shout out to the Michigan voters who just passed same day. Something, one second. Oh, uh, early voting and same day uh, voting. And she wants to make sure that everyone knows that we need to make uh, nationwide um, voting an election day, it needs to be a holiday. And I agree with her. Um, Tomas, earlier you were saying your, your parents were taking off work to go vote. And that's something I'm very proud to hear you say because I know people who would not, if, if their job didn't afford them the couple hours to go vote before, after, or during work, they wouldn't do it. Um, and I do think if people can lose their lives to vote, you can lose a couple dollars to vote. Or you, you, can, lose a, you can lose a half hour to, to, to go vote. Uh, but that is another hindrance that we have because they'll make it take much longer. You won't know where you're supposed to go in and, and stuff like that. So it's a lot. And Kayla, every time you get on, you got these facts ready and these statistics. And I greatly appreciate it because everybody who has a platform does not need or deserve the platform they have because people out here just be saying anything. And I appreciate every black person that finds the bag and, and gets it. But some of this stuff that people are getting famous for is not helpful. Um, and as much as I love us to go find a book and read a book, some of y'all read one book and, you know, cook up some stuff that I just, everybody that has a platform does not need one. And I appreciate you all who come with the facts and actually look up the things that you need to be talking about. So great. Um, I want to share Monisha and then we'll go to Tomas. Monisha put in the chat. Um, she wanted to say that she thinks social media is showing who people really are. Uh, unfortunately, friendships are breaking up, but I think it's OK because I, I, I'm at the point to where I'm understanding that everybody in my life is not designed to be in my life forever. There are some things called seasonal friends. They're meant to be in your life for a season. And it's okay to let people go and grow. Like let, let them go, let them grow. And they need to let me go and let me grow. And I'm okay with that, you know? So I do agree with the fact that we're starting to see who people really are on social media. Go ahead, Tomas. Yeah, I'm gonna, don't worry, I'm gonna keep it brief because I know that we're kind of running on some time here, but I was basically kind of gonna say about how I think social media, though it has many negative aspects to it as far as politics and division and whatnot, that actually, once again, if you take a deep breath, go back to the curriculum of peeping game, you will kind of notice how certain political figures, how they at first try to present themselves in a certain manner on the national television or whatever have you, or at large speeches and whatnot, they begin to unravel. I mean, 
I mean, kind of right now, it's really obvious to see it in the debates, how certain people unravel and, you know, kind of in front of our eyes. But I would say that social media is kind of the behind the scenes, you know, the part of it in whatever election, but kind of really a lot in this election, like outside of the, the little Rose Garden speeches that, you know, um, certain, and I know I'm being obvious, trying to code it up, but I'm, I'm just saying, you know, that, you know, that Trump is having, you just see the behind the scenes, the same thing with Biden or like whoever else, commonly, you see their personalities, you see what they're like in, you know, behind the curtain, you know, you kind of see who they are, what they're like, you might learn some more facts. And I think also social media has provided us with ways to educate ourselves more on certain issues and kind of um, about certain politicians. Though you got to be careful because a lot of, there's a lot of misinformation, like you just see already at the title, oh, conservative um, power, that kind of, you know, something like that, uh, um, underscore you'll already know that certain people are really biased and are gonna just spit out random stuff. But if you kind of go to the more, I don't know, cause if you go to the more kind of like, make, I'm just, I don't know, because just, just because you're certified doesn't mean, cause you know, there's some certified, you know, celebrities right now that are not spitting, you know, what's good for the kin or whatever, my skin, the kin, you know, they're not really doing that at all. They're um, doing what's killing, but, um, you know, kind of to go back to what I was saying, if you go to people who have a reputation of spitting good news, like PBS or um, the soapbox stand, they're really, they're biased, but I like them though. So that's the, but they, they kind of tell you what you don't hear, you know, or um, the TED Talks or NPR, you know, kind of go to the more neutral places and you can really educate yourself. Like me, I never knew about SARS and whatnot. I didn't know that there was a police force in Africa, and you know, um, I don't know I forgot what country it is, but, Nigeria. or what, Nigeria, I didn't know about, I knew that there was, you know, a disease outbreak and stuff, but I didn't know that the police, it was like that there. I didn't know about what was happening to my brothers and sisters in Armenia. My Armenian friend kind of schooled me and let me know that, because they're against the Azerban. And I guess America sometimes, they kind of spread misinformation about it, and they're trying to make Azerban, I know I'm slaughtering the name, I'm sorry to my Armenian friend, Savan, I'm sorry, but as a band, they're, they're trying to be the victim here. When it's the Armenians that are, they went through the genocide back in the night, early um, 20th century, and then they're going through, not a, I don't know the exact facts, I don't want to spread misinformation, but long story short, they're really the victim now too. So this kind of further um, educates you. And lastly, I wanted to make my closing point kind of outside of, or let me tie this one more point, and then I'll make this last point. But kind of within it, I was going to say how um, a lot of our generation, and it's it's kind of a curse, a lot of us are lazy. We don't want to go and research the facts and learn about um, certain politicians, which is why social media can be good to kind of educate people right when they're going on their feet. But like I said, you got to kind of research the page, look at it. Maybe, I mean, you can Google anything. You can Google, you know, the DoorDash delivery, you can do all this. So why can't you Google about who is this person? Who's that president and whatnot? So you know, I just want your mind media has been, um, you know, good in a way more convenient for us youth. but I don't let don't feel too comfortable. Don't be like, don't be lazy. But my last point I was going to say is there's a lot of people out there that are like, oh, you know, I don't like Biden and I don't like Trump. I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like I don't like, you know, and I just kind of wanted to say that it's not a large it's not a dedication. It's not a valent, you know, like when you're choosing them, it's not like you love them. You're giving a Valentine's Day card or proposing to any candidate. It's more like a, you're in gym, right? And you're picking teams, you know, and you join the team that, you know, you're going to work together. You know, you might not agree with your teammates, but you're going to work together in the dodgeball, kickball game, whatever. And you're going to make it through and they can benefit you. They impact you. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have to like them. You kind of, you know, but I just wanted to say that it's not a, it's not a proposal to them. It's not a Valentine's Day, a candy gram. It's nothing like that. Oh, I love, you know, all of that is nothing like that. It's just another chess piece move in life. And, you know, that leads to many other moves that impact you. So that's just what I want to say to all the people out there, you know, as we described in the last show, um, you know, through taxes, how your money is spent how money, um, how, what health care you get, you know, all of that is determined by who's the, the head of state. So I just wanted to, you know, kind of point that out there that don't twist that up, whether it be the religious things, like we said earlier. I mean, we don't never want to um, criticize harshly anybody, but it's just like a reanalysis of yourself. It's a real reanalysis of your um, theism and theology, all of that, and kind of just do what God would do, you know, so. Great. Thanks, Tomah. Yeah. 
So it, we've had some interesting conversation. We kind of want to wrap it up with our final question. Um, but again, just remember that um, voting is right now a lifeline for many people. And it is something that will impact us in many different ways, as Tomas has said. And so we're the Flint Public Health Youth Academy and all youth are not old enough to vote, you know? And so we're gonna have our last question read and we're gonna talk about possibly some things that young people can do. Go ahead, what's the last question? Okay, I'll go ahead and do the last question. Um, okay, speaking of social media, what are some creative ways that youth can advocate and encourage the adults in, in their life to vote? Okay, we will do Kayla first. So I, uh, for one, have been very active in voting in the voting process for several years now. And this is actually my first year where I'm able to actually vote in the election. So I say that to say that there are many ways that we as young people, even prior to being voting age, can be active in the voting process. Uh, and so me personally, I always went the route of just being like, hey, let's talk and if it's like my grandma my grandpa like they they want to talk anyway they ready to catch up they want to know what's going on in my life they want to know what my grades have been like like for real just hey how are you uh i just want to i i personally uh would say go go down your contact list if they're voting age hey we ain't talked in a minute what's going on with you how has your life been man, you know, everything's really crazy right now with the election going on. Are you voting? You know, uh, I just want to have the facts ready. I just, I just was wondering, oh, you said you're voting for so-and-so? Oh, well, did you know this? Did you know this about their administration? Did you know this about what he's done? Do you know this about what he stood for? Do you know this about, and, and make it a conversation. Uh, I would also say for those of you who are still eating dinner at the dinner table with your family, that's a great time to bring up politics. Like, why not? We're in the middle of a presidential debate. So, I mean, just so, so Ma, how was your day at work? It was good. They were stressing you out. Who are you voting for? Like, <laughs> let's be frank. <laughs> let's be frank. Let's be honest. Let's be loving. But also let's acknowledge the fact that these are conversations that we need to be having with our loved ones. Like we, if anyone, you should not be tiptoeing around these conversations with your loved ones. So I would just say first, as a young person, educate yourself as if you were voting. Like, don't, don't do the minimum just because you know you can't vote. No, educate yourself on these people because eventually you will vote. So first, educate yourself and then just have conversation with these people um, and, and, and bring the facts with you. Because uh, honestly, I would say, I, I think in my experience, people are excited to just know like they're, the young person in their life is smart enough to do research for themselves in the first place. Great. Anyone else want to talk about some things young people could do? Everett, I see your hand up. Uh, yeah. Being somebody that can't vote, uh, I'm not a voting age right now. Um, I'm not going to say I've done the best job of um, getting people out there to vote and um, really expressing how I feel about it, but I am doing better and I'm trying my best to continue to do better. But I just want to say for like all the people out there watching this, like me, like, you got to say something like maybe maybe you don't have to be the most opinionated or know all the facts, but you got to say something. You got to say, hey, well, I know this. I don't know everything, but I do know this. So you got to talk to the people and become educated, like Kayla was saying. Like for me, the biggest thing this year for me and even last year and years before is would be is becoming educated, educated about winning because there were so many things that I didn't know that now I do know in the matter, like the blink of an eye that I just – all it took was a little bit of research and now I'm educated and I can make an educated decision or have an educated conversation about voting. And that's what you should strive towards. Not being the most perfect person and knowing all the answers, but at least knowing something. So that's my two cents on that. Cruz? So a lot of your options are limited because Rona, but um, some things to throw out there potentially when, uh, if you're still young, then you can't vote is uh, you can help candidates by door knocking. You know, that's not necessarily the funnest thing, but that's, that's a route you could take. 
Um, Kayla's and Everett's point really makes sense in the case that where the people around you are voting for is going to impact you, um, especially as you, whether it's, you know, voting for school board, uh, voting um, on how much uh, schools get and things like that. Or it could be as simple as, you know, pre presenting resources in the community so that you can um, li live in a community that's good for you, whether that's, you know, reopening parks or things like that. And so really it's learning a little bit, um, educating yourself, and then speaking to people that you think will listen. I mean, maybe maybe there are some people that you can't speak to about this type of thing. And so you might have to figure out who you can. But for the people that you can speak to, they should know how you feel. It should take you into mind when they're um, voting behind that ballot. Like, oh, my younger cousin or my nephew spoke to me. And this thing is really important to them. And so I'll take it into consideration when I'm voting now. And that stuff does matter because people are busy. Um, I'm not really a full adult. I mean, legally I am, but I find myself busy. So I'm not surprised when, you know, my mom or, you know, any other adult that's in my life, you know, doesn't have the time to research. That's not to say that they shouldn't, because they definitely should. But if you can help them out in the process, um, it's a good idea. Great. Anyone else? So I'll just say to all the other young people, you know, you may not be old enough to vote, but if you're old enough to drive, maybe you can, you know, pledge to drive five or six people to the polls. Or you may not be old enough to drive, but you definitely got a smartphone and you got about four or five cousins and uncles and aunties you can call and just nag them until they show you the sticker, send a picture of I voted and make sure that they've done it. So there are so many things that you can do, um, even as a youth, to ensure that you're a part of the, the election process. So um, anyone else have any final comments before we shut this down? Hearing none, well, thank you all out in social media land for joining the Flint Public Health Youth Academy in our talk show series, A Youth Perspective. We're on every other Friday at 6.30, so we won't be on next Friday, but the Friday after that, we'll be right back here sharing not only things that affect us from a policy and a political perspective, but we're public health. And so public health is everything. We're talking about social justice issues. We're talking about health, environment, everything that you can think of because public health is everything. So we thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Have a great evening. Goodbye, everybody.